Hello and welcome everyone to our speaker series. Today we're going to be speaking with Dr. Harsha Rajasimha. He is an incredible person at this juncture in our lives to be speaking with here at the NDF. He is an expert in genomics and he's a data scientist with 17 years of experience in precision medicine. Uh, this is a very emerging space in the healthcare universe, and um, he is extraordinarily accomplished. He's a social entrepreneur who has founded several organizations, but they each focus on accelerating therapies for rare disease. He's the founder of the Indo-US Organization for Rare Diseases. He is the founder of the Rare Diseases India, and most recently he has founded Jiva Informatics Solutions. And that's what we're going to be talking to him about today. Um, Harsha, welcome to our speaker series. Thank and, you for having um, me. My pleasure to have you here. Uh, we want to hear uh, upfront from you what separates Jiva from other patient registry platforms. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the biggest thing is data ownership, right? So patient groups are the rightful owners or stewards of the aggregate patient data. And that's when they have the most leverage in collaborating with multiple research organizations, multiple pharmaceutical companies to accelerate therapy for the rare disease community that they serve. So we put the data ownership squarely in the hands of the patient groups that we work with. That's the biggest differentiator. Uh, and so as, you're saying that others don't do that? Most of them don't, uh, especially the ones that are uh, free um, and uh, that uh, provide it as a resource. Uh, they do uh, give ownership to individual patient records, um, uh, to the individual patients, but then uh, the aggregate data of all the patient uh, together, that, uh, you know, sometimes it's skew you have to be really careful in reviewing uh, who has access to it. You, you may have access to it, but they may also be selling it. And, and they may be transparent about it, um, but you, you need to read the fine print to know exactly how the data is being used. In general, it's a good saying that if the product is free, you are the product. So Absolutely. You need to be very much aware of that. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's the biggest differentiator. The second is uh, we bring all the pieces of uh, logistical coordination, you know, the email, SMS, electronic informed consenting, uh, educating the patients, uh, you know, multimedia content management, all of those in a single login. You know, uh, the patients and the researchers have one place to go uh, to log in. Uh, that's the other second uh, 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 differentiator. You know, you can. Uh, there are other platforms also which have a single login, but they don't bring in the email and SMS and other communication capabilities, which becomes a nightmare from a logistical coordination point of view. Imagine sending a reminder text message to 300 patients individually from a cell phone or managing a WhatsApp group where you have to respond to every single message that comes in. So you can do all that with a single click and uh, save templates and manage those communications, et cetera, in a single login. Perfect. I mean, that seems like a, a really good solution because I know that it can be quite labor intensive managing patient registries. So I guess we're excited to hear you make a presentation now that goes into the details that you just sort of went over and um, so that we can evaluate whether or not this is something that is something we want to use here at the NDF. And if our patients feel good about it, uh, then it's something that we're considering. So thank you in advance for your presentation and I will sign off and turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for the opportunity and I'll dive right in. We have a lot of material to cover today and I'm going to be talking about accelerating the accelerating the relay from patient registry to clinical trials to long-term follow-up uh, studies and then back again. So it's a full loop. You know, you start with, uh, you know, patient registries are often the first step in the uh, rare disease therapy development process. So I'll be hitting home quite hard on the importance of having the right data and starting early and how that can help with the drug discovery and development process. So the key takeaways of the talk today will be to uh, make sure we fully recognize the value of patient uh, data in therapy development process. Critical considerations that one needs to go through uh, while selecting a software tool for patient registry or a natural history study. 
uh, you have to think long term because these are at the very foundational elements in in a long journey of getting a therapy done you know think of cystic fibrosis right it took 35 years before we had a therapy for cystic fibrosis but the registry work had to begin decades before we had a therapy in the market and then even beyond that right so uh, having uh, one therapy is not the goal uh, really having enough therapies to address and improve the quality of life on an ongoing basis. So this is very long-term. And then uh, accelerating the clinical research process. So I'll talk about why and how clinical trials are the most complex endeavor undertaken by mankind. And then strengthening the digital engagement. And it's not all about technology. Technology is a critical enabler, but human touch uh, needs to be balanced with uh, digital. Uh, between uh, strengthening the bond between the clinical researchers and the patients. Though they are the key stakeholders. So for me, most of my work, the inspiration comes from within my family. Uh, I lost my dear brother about three years ago uh, to a chronic disease that uh, he battled uh, since his uh, childhood and the therapies that worked well did, could not sustain his life. Uh, he, I, uh, he passed away in, a, uh, in his thirties. So uh, that's when I uh, decided to uh, develop uh, Jiva uh, as a technology platform in a human-centric fashion to accelerate all aspects of rare, rare and chronic conditions. So when you look at the patient data and journey with a rare disease, you, you know most patients with rare diseases uh, remain undiagnosed. We, we know that you know the average time is five to seven years, and then once they get a diagnosis uh, with a disease uh, that has a FDA approved treatment, which is about 5% of all rare diseases, we know that, right? Uh, then they are lucky enough uh, to, now, then the question is, how do we access that therapy? Is it affordable? Uh, is, the, uh, is, is there a way it, I can access that? Then, uh, you, uh, you know, if the patient is diagnosed with a disease without any of FDA approved uh, treatments, then uh, you have to look at, is there any ongoing clinical trials that this patient can enroll with? And, and then if, if, uh, beyond that, it's the long-term follow-up, right? So how well is the therapy working? Whether it's standard of care or a you know, uh, investigational therapy in clinical trial, how, how did it work? And what are the side effects? What are the long-term implications um, and such? So diagnosis uh, in the early stage, uh, patient registry and natural history study is where uh, most patients have to begin or the uh, patient groups as a whole in aggregate and then uh, that would, can be a, a very important foundation as they can form a, a control arm or, or uh, have the uh, provide a patient's uh, self-control data before treatment and after treatment during the clinical trial and then long-term monitoring. So currently, uh, roughly about 2,000 rare disease trials are registered in the clinicaltrials.gov database. So if, given that background, you know, when you look at how patient data can drive research. Patients and caregivers are the experts in their diseases and, and they are more than just subjects in, in clinical trials. We know that but they are critical partners. Without patients, we can't really ad, uh, advance uh, the therapy development. Now, that involves interventional trials, uh, you know, phase zero, one, two, three um, trials um, during investigation and post-market or it could be observational data collection studies such as patient registry, natural history, or real world evidence, you know, once it's out there to gather more on a population scale. Um, you know, for a variety of uh, disease uh, or medical, in, uh, medical conditions, right? Uh, the focus today is rare genetic diseases, of course. Um, and then there are also other types of studies like biospecimen collection, biorepositories, diagnostic studies, uh, you know, uh, uh, those types of things. So uh, irrespective, the process of uh, bringing a new therapy to through regulatory approval is probably the most complex endeavor undertaken by mankind, right? If you look at all the moving parts, the complex scientific molecular aspects that come during the discovery early R&D process, and then the animal model studies or other preclinical studies that have to be done before any first in human trials are approved by the uh, FDA, say with a, uh, starting with a investigational new drug application, 
then getting the regulatory approval is a six to seven year process from that point onwards, right? So it, it's a pretty long, complex, cumbersome process involving multiple stakeholders all working together. Uh, and that's what makes it very complex. It's not a uh, equation in physics or math that would, you, you know exactly how, what to expect. There are a lot of variables. Uh, the biology is complex, medicine is complex. You need to get, generate evidence to find out whether it's safe enough and effective enough to be approved. And, and no surprise, nine out of 10 therapies fail in, in these clinical trial process. But a lot of that um, you know, cannot be changed, but a lot of it can also be changed. And where are those opportunities and gaps to really optimize and make this process better? That's, that's where I have been focused on for the last several years now. So if you look at in the preclinical, non-clinical uh, uh, space, that's where the patient registries and natural history studies uh, come in. You know, it's not just the lab work that's uh, important or the animal model work, but creating enough understanding of the patient data early on. Do not wait until a phase one trial or, or a um, actual in, uh, you know, gene therapy trial is starting. You need to start the registry and natural history study way, way before that. Uh, if you want to really uh, accelerate this process. And then beyond that, after the approvals, you know, gathering real world evidence, because think of gene therapies that are costing a million or a couple million dollars per therapy, uh, one-time uh, therapy, right? But how do you know whether it worked or not? You, you need to, uh, the payers are demanding uh, evidence that the therapy is actually working in this particular patient. Even if it worked in say 90% of the patients during clinical trial, what's the, they need evidence that it's working in every single patient before releasing a million dollar in uh, reimbursement. So for that, obviously you need to monitor for the long-term safety and durability of that uh, therapy. And that's the, the only way to do that is uh, to have digital tools. You know, uh, patients are uh, do not have the incentive to go back to a clinic once they have received that one-time treatment, right? So why should they be expected to go frequently to the clinic um, unless it, there is a need? And that's where uh, digital engagement can really help. Now, looking at the patient registry as uh, a type of clinical study, right? So any study that involves human subjects is a clinical research study and patient registries are no different, right? So and they're, they are very useful tools uh, to collect and uh, manage uh, quality, high quality data um, are more guided when the research agenda for the therapeutic area and the patient population are very clearly defined upfront, right? What type of information do you want to collect? How do you, how do you collect that information? And who is collecting that data? Whether it's patient self-reporting or caregiver reporting or a clinician making that assessment, right? Where do you store that uh, data? Is it uh, in an encrypted uh, secure location or can it sit on anybody's uh, desktop computers or uh, you know how do you store it and uh, encrypt it and transmit it uh, and whole disease areas uh, that, that are covered. So you need to look at you know do you only want to focus on one specific disease or a group of related diseases? What's your inclusion exclusion criteria? So if all patients in that registry are going to be homogeneous with a very specific diagnosis, then you want to be clear about all those things upfront. And then natural histories are a natural progression of a registry uh, uh, in some sense, in that you, you may have demographic and contact information in the registry. Now you want to collect more clinical and uh, deeper data about their standard of care, what are the unmet needs, uh, that type of thing. And, and so that becomes a natural uh, course of progression of the disease in individual patients. Now, having this uh, is very useful as control arms for interventional clinical trials that uh, 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 can result in FDA approvals. And so that uh, this is a very valuable data to start collecting and thinking about. Now, those are all um, the types of studies that come before you get into a human uh, clinical trial with a investigational therapy, whether it is antisense oligonucleotide or a gene therapy or you know, a small molecule drug or an injectable biologic, right? So either way, um, you have a lot of background data about the patients, the disease, the natural progression. Now, during the clinical trials, 
it's no different. It's you're still doing the similar activity of enrolling specific patients into a specific study. So one one thing we uh, did is uh, you know we went out and interviewed two thousand stakeholders of clinical trials, and one of the things we heard is every a clinical trial feels like the first ever trial undertaken by mankind. And every single time you have the same set of issues and they don't seem to get better and better, uh, right? So in fact, the cost of developing drugs has gradually declined uh, or is becoming inefficient, right? It's now, it used to be about 700 million a uh, few years ago, a decade ago. Now it's more than two and a half billion dollars, the average cost of bringing one therapy to market that's just simply unsustainable. And so you, we need to now look at how, what are the common issues that affect every single trial and how can we ad address these logistical issues, right? Because we, we can't just say that every trial is different and so let's just focus on this one trial. And that's what has been causing all these delays and cost. That's what we have done with the uh, Jiva, which I will talk in, in a bit more detail. And then after the phase one, two, three, and you, know, you also need to remember that these are no longer hard sequence, uh, sequential phases anymore. There is like phase one and two can get combined or two and three can get combined or you, know, you go straight to phase three without uh, zero, one or two. So there's all sorts of uh, FDA uh, has made, innovated in the regulatory uh, space. So uh, that whole gamut, you need to look at how uh, you know, the interventional trials are done. And finally, after they are approved. Now, if you look at any single clinical study involving human subjects, they all have to go through this long and complex process, right? Starting with design of a protocol, exactly what are the primary endpoints, secondary endpoints, uh, what kind of protocol amendments may be necessary. You need to anticipate and avoid any such protocol amendments. Then site selection. What are the, where do you want to conduct this uh, clinical study? Is it going to be virtual entirely or do you have one or more physical sites, uh, university or a hospital site? And then uh, regulatory approvals that you may need before the starting the study. And that ties in with where the studies are located, which countries they, they are located in. And then configuring that study and then patient recruitment. Now in rare diseases, you know, especially if it's a, a life-saving therapy, patients are willing to travel the other side of the planet to get, gain access to it. So it's, uh, many times it's not a problem to find and recruit patients uh, for many diseases. However, there are five different biotech companies developing gene therapy for the same disease, let's say. Now, you, you can't have the same patient participate in multiple trials. So, you know, you, you are running out of options when you look at 90% of these clinical trials happening in the United States and Europe, um, you know, you, you need to find more patients willing to travel from other countries because most of the patients already identified in, in the Western region are already enrolled in some sort of a trial or are uh, not eligible for one or the other criteria. And then you get into clinical assessments, follow-up visits, patient reported outcome, data collection, reporting results back to patients and the regulatory submissions, right? And so that's still a lot of uh, moving parts and variables, a uh, lot of things can go wrong. So you have to, uh, it's a very controlled process. And that whole thing can take six, seven years. And uh, currently total of all diseases combined about 88,000 clinical trials, but only about 2000 of them are specifically focused on rare diseases. So uh, many of the people we interviewed included uh, you know, biotech, pharmaceutical, clinical operations folks, CROs, hospital sites and research coordinators, principal investigators, patient advocacy groups, individual patients who went through clinical trials, regulatory experts. And, you know, we gathered various perspectives and we uh, learned that even within a given biotech or pharma company, uh, the medical affairs does not know what's going on in R&D necessarily and the, you know, the different departments and disease areas, uh, some innovation that happened in rare disease the group is not uh, known to someone working in oncology. You know, I'm talking about these large 100,000 employee companies, right? So it, it, th there is all these disconnect and it's uh, no one person is a decision maker many times, right? So even though 
they, they, are, they have a title, it's a group decision and a collective decision. And so there's a lot of people influencing uh, what goes on. And uh, many times decisions are, have to be made because it's time to make a decision rather than uh, making the right decision. So uh, when you look at the big problem, what we heard is patient enrollment is the number one problem. Um, which uh, is average of all diseases, not specific to rare, and only about 3% of all eligible patients actually enroll in a clinical trial. And many of them uh, decline because either they are uh, you know, afraid of being uh, not receiving the treatment, they may be placebo, or fear of side effects, and many other, uh, but there's about one fourth of them decline because of the travel burden and the logistical burden. And that's an a very addressable problem, uh, which has uh, remained unaddressed for a long time for various reasons. And you know, think about every day delayed. Of course, it costs many patients' lives many times, but also it costs a lot of time to the sponsors. Uh, you know, every day that uh, uh, drug is delayed in getting the approval. So when you look at the challenges that patients go through in accessing a clinical study finding the study in the first place, then coordinating travel, missing work and taking time off, finding childcare for uh, their children, or uh, you know, finding a caregiver for their, uh, comp you know, the traveler. So it, it's all a lot of logistical burdens there. And when um, nine out of 10 trials fail, uh, then they are terminated many, many times because of uh, low enrollment and there is a blame train that begins, right? So what went wrong? Who did it? Why couldn't we start it the right, right way? Right vendor selection, tool selection, site selection, some, you know, somewhere someone has to be blamed. And so if you look at how clinical research studies are done today, you, there's a lot of burden on the study staff. You know, they have to uh, toggle between their email, SMS, and uh, you know, the uh, informed consent process, patient reported outcome data collection questionnaires, and a lot of it is still, you know, paper-based and some is electronic. So you have to toggle between a lot of different part, moving parts here. That's very inefficient and uh, time-consuming and uh, thankless job that the clinical study staff have to do. Now, you, you look, uh, so that, that creates a huge uh, opportunity for creating a integrated, aggregated to a platform where all of these tools can come together in a single coherent login. So that's what we developed at Jiva. You only have a single login for patient or uh, the study staff to log in and they would see all the functionality in, in one place. And then uh, it's highly scalable. You can, uh, you, when you think of N of one clinical studies, you know, like the Mila or JASI, um, those types of studies or any patient can start collecting their own individual data comprehensively using Jiva, or it could be a population scale study as well with uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of patients uh, using it at public health uh, context for a COVID-19 trial even. So that kind of scalability is very important. And then you have, the, and that should be not something you decide when you start, you can start with 10 patients and then you go on adding and growing that study as well. So it's, it should be scalable at any time. And most importantly, in the context of rare diseases and patient group led uh, studies, uh, data ownership is very critical. Uh, you know, when uh, say a uh, patient registry is sponsored by a third party, they often like to gain control over the aggregate data. You know, they'll say individual patients, you, you have right to opt out and take your own data, but the aggregate de-identified data is something that owned by the sponsor of the registry or a clinical study. So you need to make sure uh, as a patient group, you, you are the most motivated to get accelerate the therapy development process. So by paying a small price for the right tool and managing that registry yourself, you can avoid uh, heartaches and more importantly, your vision and mission to accelerate the therapy for your disease, you, you will end up losing that. And so that's one of the biggest uh, considerations there. And obviously patient privacy, security, data security is all crucial. And then the other part is, does it work on any device, right? So you can't expect everyone to be using a very specific like iPhone to um, participate in a study or a registry. And 
even someone who accesses from iPhone should also be able to access from a laptop or a computer, iPad or Android phones or any other device. So that's what we designed Jiva to be a browser accessible device uh, a system. So uh, patients and staff can access it from the convenience of any uh, device from their home. That's how it works. Uh, and we, we are working towards making this a um, user uh, uh, adaptive design. Uh, the user interface can uh, automatically adapt to uh, adult or child, for example. And it's modular in that you don't need to use a sledgehammer for all studies, right? So depending on your study, you may choose to uh, choose trial magnet as a package that comes out of the same Jiva eClinical Cloud, which is, which is a comprehensive suite of all the modules and features. Now you can build your own package depending on your need. If you are working on a patient registry, you may need you know, eligibility screening, informed consent, and a drag and drop form builder where you can build surveys and questionnaires to collect specific uh, information like you know, e uh, electronic patient reported outcomes. Or if the clinician is making assessments, you can choose to do the ECOVA, the clinical outcomes assessments module. And then the omni-channel enrollment, you, know, you want to be able to enroll patients from text messaging, WhatsApp, uh, Facebook, any group. So the system needs to be slightly open in a secure way so that patients can get into the system uh, from uh, uh, social media channels and other channels. And then enabling that bi-directional communication uh, between study staff and patients by email, SMS, and multiple channels. That's crucial. But you know, if you choose to add additional packages, uh, like uploading lab reports, which may not be uh, part of most studies, but if your study involves patients uploading a lab report or a video, you know, like a seven minute walk test or any other type of file, file formats, that's very easy to add such modules in, in the Jiva system. And we are working towards a bi-directional video conferencing uh, module that uh, will be available uh, later this year, uh, but the rest of the modules are uh, available today. So uh, when you look at uh, starting with protocol design in any clinical study, you, you want to start thinking about the primary and secondary endpoints, the inclusion exclusion criteria, and how, how to avoid any amendment of protocol because these are expensive. If you change the protocol during the course of a study in any significant way, it may require you to go back and reconsent the patients all over again. And so you want to design both your informed consent form as well as the protocol in as much foolproof manner as possible by anticipating possible changes that may have to occur in the future. So it, it, it's better to take a few days upfront to get those right than to rush through the initial process and then it's way more expensive later on. And all the logistical considerations that we discussed. Now, these can be effectively leveraged for patient-focused drug development that the uh, FDA has been advocating and championing, right? So we, we are all aware of the uh, rare disease patient listening sessions. Now, when, only when patients speak up and express their point of view, the protocols can be designed right and uh, protocol amendments can be avoided. And the logistical consideration, many times uh, we don't think about the detailed logistical issue of you know, travel and, you know, the, the paper versus electronic and uh, whether this needs to be, uh, you know, requires a patient to travel uh, to the clinic in person or can it be done remotely? Sometimes it, it cannot be avoided and that's fine, but you need to be really thoughtful and deliberate about all those aspects. So I'll skip through this uh, slide. It, it talks about why patient-centric trials are very important, right? So it, it can really improve the chances of study success. And everybody uh, knows this, but yet these are still not as common as we like it to be. And, and But we are seeing the value. Uh, as you can see, the likelihood of a drug launch uh, uh, is significantly increased uh, when it's done in patient-centric protocol designs versus non-patient-centric trials. So there is opportunity to make this happen at scale, right? So that's what the Jiva platform's uh, vision is. Now, this is the most critical logistical considerations uh, slide, right? So when you look at uh, the informed consent process, um, 
it needs to be truly informed consent, right? So it's not just, hey, sign here. If you like to be part of the study, sign here, right? So it's it's about informing the patient about what this what data is collected, why it is being collected, how it will be used, how it will benefit you, and how it will benefit the community at large in advancing science, medicine, and how it will help patients that will come after you. That's all part of the education that needs to occur before a patient can be expected to um, up, uh, you know, consent or not consent, right? So, and to do that in clinic, in person, is always a safe and best thing to do from a uh, compliance standpoint, because the institutional review boards appreciate that. They consider the informed consent very divine, right? So nobody wants to rush through the process and every physician investigator wants that, right? They want to make sure the patient understands and is comfortable. But imagine explaining the same protocol, same issues over and over again, one patient at a time to thousands of patients or hundreds of patients, significant uh, repetitive duplicate tasks that can be avoided. If it can be done properly, effectively, where patient can review all that information from their home on their own device, you know, everybody uh, saves a lot of time, energy, and, uh, and it's even better because physicians often are uh, time crunched and they may have to get it done in 10 minutes or 15 minutes, the average time uh, of consultation. But if patients can watch a 30 minute video, read the PDF, uh, have the ability to ask questions with the uh, study team remotely and then make a determination, that's, that's great. Similarly, you know, questionnaires, whether paper-based at a site or from home. So I have placed these, uh, uh, you know, diamonds intentionally in the middle. So uh, for every study, the study team should ask the question, what is the right look, uh, positioning for this diamond? for informed consent questionnaire, et cetera. And the tools that you select have to really be flexible enough to uh, enable you to make these adjustments, right? It's not just on the slide and on a piece of paper, but in reality to make this actually adapt adaptable and flexible in a tool. So you can actually run the study and this may have to change, right? In one year, two year, five years, because these are long-term studies. So you have to uh, really think uh, from that point of view. And that's exactly what Jiva does, uh, is uh, providing uh, you the flexibility to address all these different uh, considerations, right? At the study operational level and the software or tool specific selection level. Uh, you know, we went over all of this and this is just a summary slide. I'll leave it on the uh, screen for you to um, grasp. There is a lot of detail here but, but you get the idea, right? So a um, lot of thinking needs to go into this. And ultimately it's uh, the people process and technology, right? It's not just technology and it's not just the people. Uh, everyone has to follow a very strict process because uh, these are uh, regulated environments, right? So there's GDPR guidelines in the EU and HIPAA here. And you know while certain nonprofit patient foundations may not necessarily come under HIPAA, uh, you, you still have to maintain the security, privacy, and uh, respect the participants uh, that uh, are in the study. So we went over the patient enrollment uh, uh, pro problem. And you know when you look at patient recruitment, uh, initially into the registry, you have the eligibility screening and make sure you identify matching patients uh, for your study. And then once you have the matching patients, you uh, need to then enroll them into your study, getting the informed consent. So you want a tool that can help you get through these steps as quickly as possible from multiple channels. And then once they are in the study, you know, uh, the, it's an ongoing uh, effort. It, it's not a one, one and done, right? So you, you got the enrollment done. Now you have to keep them engaged. They have to respond to surveys. They have to respond to follow-up visits, answer any questions, respond to emails and texts. So it's an active bi-directional engagement going between study team and patients throughout the study. And so, and that's critical for retaining patients in the study long-term. So when you look at the Jiva eClinical Cloud platform and the study magnet package, uh, it's built in that uh, modular 
passion and that helps you with faster patient recruitment, reducing the logistical burden by over 70%. We estimate that you can speed up the enrollment process by three times faster with doing everything electronically and in one place, right? And But you, you can save cost as well in terms of any sample collection visits, you know, whether the patient goes to the site or, the, uh, or if phlebotomist goes to the patient home to collect samples, uh, you know, in either case, you can reduce a lot of uh, the cost and the logistical burden. Minimizing the patient dropout in clinical trials and better user experience for everyone involved, right? So uh, patients, of course, but also the study team, they take a quite a bit of uh, burden on their shoulders. Um, so if in a JIVA study workflow, you know, you go through study configuration, uh, communications, screening for eligibility, getting the informed consent signed um, and reviewed, patient reported outcome data collection configuration, and there is a patient facing app, right? So that's the biggest uh, um, value is we really address that gap of uh, engagement between study team patients, right? On, on the same platform for all activities that need to occur in the course of a study of any kind. So the process is very simple. It, there is no installation. There is no app you need to download. Right, you basically go to a browser-based uh, a browser URL that you receive invitation by email, uh, and that's generated in in within minutes, literally. Where you know an administrator from Jiva creates a study account. Now the study administrator can then create additional study users. Now any of these uh, authorized study users can then start configuring the study, uh, bulk import patients from an Excel file start communicating back and forth, right? Uh, and then once they are ready for informed consenting, you can not kick off that process. You can define an automatic drag and drop workflow for what are the steps involved in enrolling patients into the registry itself or, or your clinical study, right? And because we developed this keeping FDA regulated interventional clinical trials in mind, uh, which is highly secure and stringent from a uh, 21 CFR Part 11 compliance and all the regulations uh, like SOC 2 and various other data security, privacy, GDPR, and other compliance. Uh, patient groups uh, don't need necessarily that level of uh, regulatory compliance, right? Uh, because they, they don't come under FDA regulations. Uh, so we created a um, lightweight package which has all the similar security features, but not as much. Uh, unnecessary burden to from a cost and management standpoint. So that's something we are able to offer nonprofit foundations at a very uh, reasonable, affordable price. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to give a demo of the product uh, or in, in, someone from my team can arrange this on a one-on-one -on -one basis or uh, any, anyone that might be interested in. So happy to do that. So uh, in, in summary, uh, the patient, uh, the Jiva eClinical Cloud um, is primarily focused on patient recruitment and retention in long-term studies, whether it's one patient or multiple patients, large number of patients, and evidence generation, you know, patient uh, reported outcomes, real world evidence, that, that type of thing. So it's really a single all-in-one integrated uh, platform that can enable patient groups, researchers, CROs, biopharmaceutical companies, and public health organizations. So uh, happy to uh, discuss more with anyone who is interested with that. You know, the key takeaways from uh, today's presentation is that we saw that why we need to start early with patient registry, natural history study, or any patient related data uh, has to go uh, start even before any animal model studies or you know, preclinical studies uh, in that phase itself, the sooner the better. So that can actually help guide experiments and protocol design. And then the uh, critical considerations while selecting a, the right partner for designing and uh, implementing and maintaining a registry uh, or a natural history study, uh, which can run really long-term. And then various strategies to accelerate clinical research by minimizing the burden on patients and study teams at various levels from protocol design to site selection, uh, you know, patient recruitment, retention, evidence generation process. 
and then strengthening the digital engagement with a human touch, right? So all of these are guided by closely listening to thousands of stakeholders who told us how they have been running studies for decades and where are the inefficiencies. Almost everyone we spoke to were frustrated and we have made the best attempt to address all those frustrations in, in this platform. So we, we have a couple upcoming uh, rare disease events uh, that are already on the calendar, like the Orphan Drug Congress or the Global Genes uh, Rare Summit or the NORD Summit. And obviously we are already starting to plan the Rare Disease Day for next February. So thank you for uh, the opportunity today to speak to you all. Uh, Lali, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, Rachel, appreciate uh, uh, inviting me today. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Harsha. That was a, a wonderful, elegant, and informative presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions about this, please contact us at info at curegenem.org. And we are especially interested in patient feedback. We will circle back with results, and Harsha will speak to you shortly. Thank you again, and we'll see everyone next week. Take care. Thank you. Bye.